David's coming to read for us. Exodus chapter 34, verses 29 through 35. And it came to pass when Moses came down from the Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the Mount, that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh him. And Moses called unto them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned unto him, and Moses talked with them. And afterward all the children of Israel came nigh, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. Until Moses had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out. And he came out and spake unto the children of Israel that which he was commanded. And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. And Moses put the veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him. Father, when Moses returned from Mount Sinai, the children of Israel could see the glory of the Lord on his face. As we read and study your word, help us to see the glory of Christ. Be with Ken as he preaches Christ and his salvation. Amen. Well, we've been studying through these portions for some time now. Moses has been up on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. A lot has occurred. The rebellion of the children of Israel making the golden calf. Moses taking the initial commandments of stone and breaking them. And then the Lord calling them back up. Nothing changes. He gave them those commandments again. Just because man is incapable of fulfilling the commandments doesn't mean that God changes. He's holy. He's just. And so that begs the question, how is it that any of us could have any hope before God? Because sitting here, we know that we've all disobeyed. We're all idolaters by nature. And we've all profane God's name. We've come out of the womb, born rebels with our fists clenched toward God. It's just a matter of time before it fully manifests itself. And yet, in the midst of all this, what a blessed truth we have here that I've entitled the shining glory of God. How does God cause his glory to shine? Well, as we see here, it's shown on the face of Moses. What was Moses? He was a mediator. Who was Moses? He represented the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if we are to understand something of the shining glory of God, it must be then in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not some nebulous, touchy-feely, glowy glory like you hear people talking about. Here in verse 29, the first verse, when it says it came to pass that when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, these must have been some large stones to chisel out the Ten Commandments. We've got it printed in our Bibles here in Exodus 20, and it takes up a few pages. So you can imagine, this, these were not any small stones that the Lord used to write out these commandments, and I dare say probably front and back on each side. Nothing more to be added to it or taken from it. This was a the represented the covenant of God, that if they were to worship God, here's how he was to be worshipped. It's not like today in contemporary worship where everybody just comes and goes however they feel they want. And God's not that way. He's holy and just. And so unless we approach unto him as he directs, then we can only know condemnation. It's like those did that followed after the golden calves. But here I see when it says the shining glory of God in verse 29, when he came down from the mount, it says that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. It's impossible to be in the presence of God himself and not have the light of his presence shine upon you. And again, as Moses was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, when he came to this earth, that glory was in him, but it was veiled in the flesh, just like Moses had to take a veil and cover his face 
because those that saw him couldn't even look upon his face because of the, the brightness of the glory. If you go over to John chapter 1, this is how the Apostle John described the glory of the Lord. Hidden in the face of Jesus Christ. Hidden in that body. John 1 and verse 14 says the word was made flesh. Well, who's the word? Go up to verse 1. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. And the word was made flesh. That's the veil. Hebrews talks about the flesh being a veil that covered that glory. Else we would not even be able to look upon it. Such is the glory. And it says he dwelt among us. But John says we beheld his glory. The glory as the only begotten son. Or the only begotten of the father. Full of grace and truth. And so when we speak of the shining glory of God. We're talking about his glory revealed in his son. That apart from seeing him. You don't know the glory of God. And so. We, we have here in uh, this incredible moment in the life of Moses, one who represents the Lord Jesus Christ coming off the mountain, the only one because of whom God did not destroy that people, that he had promised to raise up a seed. And even Moses later would say that the Lord would raise him up from among them, his prophet, hear him. So Moses understood that what he represented was the glory of God. As much so as Christ represented the glory of God in the flesh. And you can see he was not boastful in it. It says here in verse 29 that he was not even aware of the skin of his face shining as he talked with him. The scriptures say that Christ humbled himself and took on flesh and became as a servant, obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He was not going about flashing his glory for people to see and be wowed. Some of them, I think, thought that that's what he should do. But nonetheless, as he went from place to place, the, the, the very glory of God was upon his face. It's not like it was shining like a halo. But everything about his demeanor Everything about his speech, everything about his person was a reflection of the glory of God. I truly believe, as Christ said, he told his disciples, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. It doesn't mean that there's not the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. But if we want to know the attributes of God the Father, we just look on the face of Jesus Christ. It's like our children. We look at them and we can see the face of the parent in the child. Well, that's the way that the Lord Jesus Christ came to this earth. The very reflection, if you will, of God the Father. He was God, and yet he reflected the very glory of God in his person, just like Moses. How did these know that he'd been on the mountain and with God? It's because his face shone. Even though he wasn't purposing it to do, it was because he had been meeting with God during that time. Over in Hebrews chapter 1, there's so many scriptures we could look at here to set the context. But the shining glory of God is, is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Here it says in Hebrews 1, in verse 1, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Well, Moses was a prophet. How did he speak with them? Face to face. Gave them his word. And yet, more importantly, it says here in verse 2, hath in these last days. People ask all the time, you think we're in the last days? Absolutely. Ever since Christ came. Because it says that. In these last days spoke unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. Just like Moses was established as the head of that house, that house of Israel over which God placed him as a representative. Even so, Christ has been appointed as the head of his house. Hebrews speaks of that too. Even as Moses was faithful in all his house, so Christ in his house. 
And it says, by whom he also made the worlds. That's the difference. Moses was a type. He was made by God for that purpose, for that time. But Christ was the one who made the worlds. And that's even more astounding when you stop and think that here was the God of creation who actually took on flesh. For what purpose? To save that people that the Father had given him. But it says in verse 3 here, again, looking at this theme of the shining glory of God, who being what? The brightness of his glory. I know sometimes we keep thinking, well, here's the Father and here's the Son. No, they are one. He is the very brightness of his glory, the express image of his person. When we get to glory one day, you're not going to see the Father sitting here, the Son here, and the Spirit here. The scriptures say that the fullness of the Godhead dwells in him. And that's true in the flesh. And even as he ascended on high, there's a man seated in glory today who is the very reflection and express image of the person of God himself and upholding all things by the word of his power. It says, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So this was true of Christ as he came in the flesh, as much as Moses was in the flesh and represented Christ before the people. So Christ came in the flesh. You say, well, why didn't people see it? Well, that glory was hidden. God purposed that it be hidden in that flesh. That's what they couldn't get a hold of. How could God ever take on flesh? You see, the thought of the day was that flesh is sinful and God is good and holy. So the two could never be the same. Well, God in the mystery of godliness became flesh without ever becoming sinful. That's the mystery of the godliness. It was impossible that he should have sin or have a, a sinful nature. God purposed that, as it says there, that, that holy thing which was created in Mary was of the Lord. And I believe that's what it speaks of when it says he's the new man created in righteousness in Ephesians 2. It's not talking about something created in here. The new man is Christ coming in the flesh created in righteousness. You say created? Yeah. It took God conceiving that seed in Mary. It's like in the beginning. He created the world from nothing. So this seed was made in the womb. And from that point forward would ever be a man. God, the God-man, throughout eternity. But the reason he did that was that he might identify with sinners such as we are. The Father gave him, for whom he paid the debt, and with whom he identifies. He's not ashamed to call him brother. I know we look around and think, oh, I'm not sure I want to call that one my brother or my sister. Well, he's not ashamed to call any that he's redeemed his brother or his sister. That's amazing. Behold, I, he said, and the children whom thou hast given me. So this is a glorious theme that we have here. And this was hidden. For Moses, as he came off the mountain, it, it was so evident. They asked Moses actually to put on a veil. That's what we just read there in our reading in 2 Corinthians. They, had to, they couldn't look on it in, in, in any way and, and be comfortable. And so it is with Christ. I truly believe that had Christ fully manifest his glory as God in the flesh, wherever he went, men could not have looked upon him. But he came to draw sinners to himself. And so he identified with those he came to save in the flesh, that glory being hidden there, but not absent. Look over in Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. This is what they call the Mount of Transfiguration. Some figure this may have been Mount Tabor, which had been near Jerusalem there. We don't know. But it was at this time that the disciples got a flavor of the veiled glory. Just like Moses put on a veil to hide that glory that shone in his face. Here it was hidden already in Christ but now unveiled for a time for them to see it. And it says here in Matthew 17, 
that after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart. Doesn't say which one. And was transfigured before them. And here it is. His face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. It was already there. It just had been hidden. The difference was Moses being the type, when he came off, it was already evident, and he had to hide it until it should be revealed in Christ, I believe is what that signifies. But it says, Behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias, talking with him. Moses and Elijah, when they died, they would have gone to Sheol, the place of the dead. And so their appearing here would have been from that place of the dead to which Christ himself went when he died on the cross for three days. But we can see that they were alive and with anticipation. I know that there are some that say, well, it's Elijah, he didn't die. He was taken up in a chariot. You go back and read there. It doesn't say that he didn't die. It's just that the Lord removed him at that time from the ministry and gave it to Elisha. But the Lord took him away, and just like with Moses, never revealed where he buried him because otherwise people would have made a shrine out of it like they do today but both men would have died there's none that has ever entered heaven apart from death even Enoch people say well Enoch it says he walked with God and was no more well when he was no more it means that the Lord took him that's what he, the word that's used and he's named among those in Hebrews 11 that died in the faith so to say he didn't die there's only been one who has ever entered into heaven, that when he died and rose again and sent on high, it was the Lord Jesus Christ as their representative. But here he answered Peter and said, then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. But while he yet spake, behold, what a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice of the, out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. The writer Luke says that when Moses and Elijah appeared, they were talking about the death that Christ should accomplish. That was their hope. They would have been in Sheol until such time as Christ accomplished their death. And then... Because of the work of the cross, all of the elect in one time, one place would have been redeemed and justified. And when the Lord ascended on high, their souls taken with him into glory. So this shining glory represented by Moses, even here, you can see him appearing with Elijah. I'm confident he was thinking back to that time on the mountain when his face shone, but nothing like this. Because this pertain to the very Son of God. And when that voice said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. Don't you think that Moses would have thought about what the Lord had said back, what he'd said in Deuteronomy 18, 15, that he'd raise up a prophet from among them. And he told the Israelites, Hear him. So Scripture confirms Scripture. And that's the one glory from beginning to end that we're talking about is the very glory of of Christ. So this pas passage that we have here in Exodus 34, coming back to my text, symbolizes that closeness between Moses and God as mediator. Scripture says there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. There's nobody ever going to see God or his glory apart from it being revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ and through him and by him. And so, taking this up in Exodus 34, in verses 29 and 30, we see where Moses' face shines when he comes down from Mount Sinai. Now, over in 2 Corinthians, I told you to turn back here, but 2 Corinthians 4, I know I'm having you turn to a lot of portions, but it's just to show you that this is the theme of Scripture, not a small theme. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, here in verse 6, tells us, 
for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of what? The glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So this is the glory of God. You've not seen the glory of God. There's that hymn that they wrote, the battle hymn of the Republic. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. But they're not talking about Christ. This is Christ. And Moses was a type as a mediator, an intercessor. And therefore, in his face, the glory of God shone forth. And that's the only place you're ever going to see the glory of God, in the face of Jesus Christ. But here, now in Exodus 34, 29, Moses, as I said, was not aware that his skin, the skin of his face did shine while he talked with God. I believe that is typical even of the humility that our Lord Jesus Christ had with his Father, the oneness. He wasn't flaunting it. When he said, I and the Father are one, it wasn't like, hey, that's my dad. No, he reflected the glory of his father without boasting or without making a big deal about it. Even almost to the point where in the flesh he was not even aware of that glory other than his desire to satisfy his father in all things. Even as a child he said that, don't you know I must be about my father's business. And so this is what preoccupied him and yet just as with Moses so the glory of God shines in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ not necessarily in a physical appearance a lot of people think well if Christ had the glory of God walked around on this earth people would have seen it that's why I chuckle a little bit when people say to live your life so that people can see Christ in you they didn't even see Christ in Christ such was this glory veiled because he appeared as a man, as it should be, because it was as a man that he came to work out the salvation of his people. Now, there's a difference when you consider the Moses, the glory that Moses had and the glory of Christ. The radiance of Moses was a reflected radiance. In other words, a received glory. It wasn't there Naturally, it was as a result of him having been in the presence of God. And, uh, but with Christ, it wasn't just a reflected glory. He was the very nature of God's glory in the flesh. And we'll ponder that till our dying day and never be able to plummet the depths of all that that means. That here in the flesh was none other than God himself. But... Even as I said, God did not exalt, or Christ did not exalt his own glory as the Son of God, but simply manifest that glory that he was in the flesh. In fact, if you look over in John chapter 8 and verse 50, and I believe in this, Moses was a type. Moses was not boasting of his place as the mediator. In fact, he bore much burden of the people. Upon himself more than what he could have handled as a man had it not been God upholding him. But here, even with regard to Christ, what did Christ say here? Though he was the very manifestation of God's glory in the flesh, yet he says here, they, and, and they accused him of being a Samaritan and having a devil. You see that but in verse 48? If you really wanted to insult somebody, especially a Jew, call him a Samaritan. That would be like calling him a half-breed. Well, and even the devil. And Jesus answered, verse 49, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and ye do dishonor me. See, this is the thing that God did with Moses to, to give him honor before the people. He caused his glory to shine from his face, and it put fear in the people. But here, because the glory of God was hidden in Christ, and they didn't see his glory, because it was hidden, therefore they dishonored him. But what does Christ say? I seek not mine own glory. 
there is one that seeketh and judgeth, and that is none other than God himself. And so here we see a comparison then between Moses and Christ, and both had the glory of God shining upon their face, but one was a type, one's an image, one's a picture, but Christ being the fulfillment. And that's what we read about in the scripture reading over in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. If you go back there again, it was a, it was a glorious sight when Moses came off that mountain and his face shone. It was bright even to such a point where the people begged him to veil his face. And uh, yet, as, the, as Paul writes to the Corinthians here in verse 7, if the ministration of death, that's talking about the law written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. That's making a, quite a statement. It was only done for a time. People still want to go back to the law and rebuild it and bring it back in and mix it with it. No. The law has been put away. It's been fulfilled. We've been married to another, and that is Christ. But that glory, see, a lot of people like to get excited about what that must have been like with Moses coming off the mount. That glory, Paul says, is not to compare with the glory that should follow. And it says there in verse 10, For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious. And notice he says done away. Why is it done away? Because it's been fulfilled. But much more that which remaineth is glorious. If God's been pleased, just like we read there in 2 Corinthians 4, to cause the light of the glory of the Christ to shine in our hearts. What a blessing that is. What a grace that is. But coming back here to Exodus 34, what was the purpose of all of this? This isn't just to make an interesting story and excite us in our reading and give us something just to, to ponder. No. This had to do with God's covenant with his people. There was a covenant that God was making with this people, rebellious as they were, yet he would not completely destroy them. Why? For Christ's sake. For the glory of his son that was to come and was to follow. And so it says in verse 31 that Moses called unto them and Aaron, all the rulers of the congregation, returned unto him and Moses talked with them. And afterward all the children of Israel came nigh and he gave them in commandment Notice it's singular. All that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. The sum of the Ten Commandments, even as Christ asked that rich man, well, what's the sum of the, the law? And he answered correctly. He said it's to love God with all your heart, soul, and spirit, and your neighbor as yourself. That's what the five commandments are about. The first five are about loving God, and the second five, loving your neighbor. So that's the foundation, and, and it's one commandment, to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. That was the covenant that he had given to that people. Well, given those, that one commandment, man couldn't obey. So it was necessary then that God should be the one who would be merciful in spite of their disobedience. And for that reason, establish a mediator even greater than Moses. Because even Moses failed as a mediator. He was but a man. It would take one being the God-man who would come and stand in the place and fulfill those commandments that the people could not. But nonetheless, as I said, God didn't change. He's still holy. He gathered Moses. He gathered the elders, the rulers of the congregation, and they had, in essence, fled. You say, well, weren't they already with him? Yeah, but when they saw his face shining, they fled because of the radiance. And so Moses calls them back as the leaders of the children of Israel to come near and then gave them 
commandment as the Lord had spoken unto him. You don't change the word just because it strikes fear in men's hearts. You declare the word as it is. And once again, Moses involves himself how? As the mediator. It's just like for any of us. We read things concerning God's glory and holiness in this word that cause us to fear or should. And yet, how is it that we can have any hope? It's only in the mediator. It's in, even as Moses here, calling them back to himself and revealing to them, again, the word of the Lord. I'm thankful we have a word from the Lord. People say that. We got a word from the Lord today? I hope so. In the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the word. And we are to hear him. But until Moses had stun, done speaking with them, it says there in verse 33, he covered his face with that veil. And whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off. He didn't need the veil on for the Lord. He was, the veil was for the people. And again, this is a type and picture of Christ. When he came in the flesh, that glory was veiled in his flesh. So that when he spoke with those that he came to save, they wouldn't be frightened. Like I said, if, if God ever manifest his glory completely except through the mediator, we couldn't take it. It'd kill us, such as his glory. And so he put the veil on until such time as he went in before the Lord. But in the presence of God, presumably at his own tent, because at this time the, the tabernacle had not yet been built, that it would have been in Moses' tent that he would have encountered the Lord. Back here in Exodus 33 and verse 7, it says Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp. So even that tells you the separation because of God's holiness. That there wasn't this familiarity that you hear about today of anybody coming and going like they want. We do have a freedom to come in the person of Christ and through his work and death. But apart from him, that door is shut. But it says afar off from the camp and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that everyone which sought the Lord went out unto the tabernacle of the congregation which was without the camp. This was even before the regular tabernacle was built. But Moses, when he went in, put a veil upon his face. And uh, so, and yet when he went in before the Lord, he took it off. He, he, his purpose was not to cause the people to fear. So that showed that this glory didn't go away. The glory of the Lord abode upon him, on his face, which makes an interesting perspective that once the tabernacle was built, where was that glory? Where's the Shekinah glory? It was over the mercy seat. Here it was in the mediator, representative of Christ, and then in the tabernacle it would have been over the mercy seat. But nonetheless, both representing the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This was the covenant that God had purposed to make with this people in spite of their rebellion and disobedience. So if Israel was saved, if they were preserved, it wasn't because of anything in them. It was because of God's mercies. And we read about it today in Psalm 117 and 118. Because of the mercies of the Lord were not consumed. And uh, so it was here. Yet there was a distance. See, there's a, there's a uh, coming together in the mediator, but still you see there a distance, knowing that unless God deals with us through the mediator, through the glory of his son, we could never approach unto him. And it says there in verse 34, he came out and spake unto the children of Israel that which he was commanded. It took him coming to them, just like it takes Christ coming to us and revealing himself in us, else we could never hope to approach unto him. And the children of Israel 
saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. And Moses put the veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him, until he went in to speak with Christ. Now, fast forward. Is it with presumption that we come before God and presume to be able to enter into his presence? No. It's according to the promise of God. Moses was but a type, but Christ has come now and fulfilled all that Moses could not have been. And that now in him we have the liberty to approach unto him with the face unveiled. If you look in 2 Corinthians 3, again the portion we read earlier. And this would be an entire message just to preach this. And how rich it is in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. Here is our liberty. It's not a matter of law and grace work of Christ plus our, no, his work having completed, it says here now in verse 18, but we all with open face beholding as in a glass, that is a mirror, the glory of the Lord. What's the mirror? That's this book right here, the Bible. So when we read here with open face, in other words, we read looking for Christ. And in the context up there, you can see there's a veil that is over the hearts of some that read this word and still don't see Christ. It says there in verse 14, their minds are blinded. Well, who blinded them? God. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. That's true of a lot of people today in the reading of the Old Testament. All they're seeing is law and Moses and tablets and they're not seeing Christ. But it's all about Christ. Here it says, which veil is done away in Christ. That's why from the beginning, you define your subject. What is the shining glory of God? Christ in the flesh. Reflected in Moses as the mediator, but in Christ the fulfillment. But even until this day when Moses is read, and you could say that even when the scriptures are read by so many who profess to be Christians... The veil is upon their heart. What are we going to hear today, preacher? We're going to hear a little bit of law. We're going to hear a few standards, morality, something to make us feel better. That's pretty much what you're going to hear, especially this time of year, setting your goals and how to be better and do better and all this stuff. No, we're not going to be any better than we are right now in this flesh. We're just depraved creatures. And... If Christ has paid our debt, we can't be any better than who we are already in him because he has fulfilled all things for his people. So that's why in verse 18, when we come, it's with open face. The idea there is freely. We don't have to veil this, this face as in a glass, the mirror, seeing the glory of, of the Lord and are changed into the same image from glory to glory. That doesn't mean you're getting better and better. But the more we see of him, the more we glory in his glory. You see? But it's by the Spirit of the Lord. This isn't something you're going to discover by research or study or figuring it out. No, it's the Spirit of the Lord that so teaches us. What a liberty we have in Christ, knowing that the very glory of God shines in his face and uh, that he has come and fulfilled all that's necessary that we might enjoy that standing before him to come freely and boldly and find grace to help in time of need. I pray that's an encouragement to us. What a blessed Savior we have.